I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to stop learning. So any of these guys that pat themselves on the back, that know everything, they're just foolish. But it's always changing. You want to feel the difference. And when that rod tip is too stiff, that very subtle, different pull is indiscernible from those little taps. People will go up. They don't see bass popping. They make a couple casts. They leave. But they don't take the time to try and figure out what's going on under the surface. You know, we'll sit there, do five of those drifts, and not catch one fish, and just go. They'll just keep going to the next spot, next spot. Right. Not me, I'm staying there. You know, you have that moment with all sorts of species of fish where you realize you are not the one that's got the upper hand in the fight, and I realized that very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that fish, it, it took off, it dug my rod tip right into the water. Hello and welcome to the Salt Strong live stream and podcast. My name is Rich Natoli. I'm your regular host of this Monday night edition. And I'm joined as always by the lovely and very talented Ed Gobo. Ed, how you doing? Good. Excited to be on tonight. This is a, a rare treat that I get to join on the coaches show. So. Oh yeah, on the coaches show. Well, it's <laughs> you should be on. You know, sometimes we don't want to have too many people on at one time, but uh, it gets hectic. <laughs> People do ask about you when you're not here, so <laughs> may as well have you on, right? Yeah, well, thanks. I feel the love. Yeah, as long as long as your wife doesn't get mad at me for stealing you away. Oh, she uh, doesn't care. Uh, I, that's what I figured. I was just being nice. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably in there thanking me right now. Yeah. Yeah, just like my wife is downstairs. Like, oh, thank God he went upstairs. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Yeah, so she's hanging out with my daughter. Um, so, Ed, have you hit the water lately? Yeah, what do we we got out? What last was it? Last Wednesday, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Because yes. I took off last Monday night to get my kayak and everything in order, and uh, which I successfully did. Got the garage cleaned out. The garage door opens now, so that's yep. that's a plus. And uh, yeah, we we got out. Um, it was a tough day. It was it was a little harder than I expected. Um, what do we? I guess we finally found them on some of those those ledges um in the river so yeah a couple of nice bass all around so it's a good day it was a nice grind and and uh insider member uh bill decals was with us he he ended up getting his first one of the year right was that the same day yeah that was the same. I, i'm i'm on lack of sleep right now i had to move my daughter this weekend <laughs> i was out <laughs> fishing today i was up at four yeah um yeah and then i was out today and i was telling pat backstage it was one of those days where, and I don't have any of the footage downloaded or anything yet, but you talk about striped bass stacked. I mean, it looked on the fish finder just like layer upon layer of bacon. It was all over the place. You could even at times like feel it bouncing off of them. And it, it, it was such a hard bite. Threw everything I had at them like three times. Ended up with three fish uh, personally. And not many people were catching. It was a, just one of those difficult days, but um, it was nice up until the wind kicked in five and a half hours early and it got a little dicey. I would say it got dangerous, but I'm just an old man who gets you know a little bit more cautious than other people. Now, let me let me quiz you, Rich. Did you happen to take notice of like any changes in the barometric pressure or anything like that? Well, you, you knew that it was dropping because the, the storm coming in. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was dropping, but it was supposed to drop. I mean, it was going to drop throughout the day. Um, I, I It was at the end of the drop. Right. And then the, the the wind came in and it was just I should have checked to, to see to see how long it had been dropping, because like with anything, a prolonged drop or a prolonged rise can affect uh, the bite. But usually, you know, the calm before the storm, it wasn't that today. It was just yeah. brutal. It was brutal. <laughs> the people were very bitter over the, the radio today. <laughs> well, I, a friend of mine, the reason I asked is a friend of mine went out uh, to the same place you were yesterday and they yeah. slayed it, slayed it, mopped them all up. So yeah, I talked surprised talk, to hear you only caught a couple. Yeah. Talked to a guy who had um, 120 yesterday between he and his two buddies, 120 fish. Uh, the smallest one, Ed, 28 inches. Wow. The smallest was a keeper. That's crazy. <laughs> Whereas the, I think the largest between the three of us that were out there together. Now there were probably 12 kayaks out there and a whole bunch of boats um, was probably 25 was the biggest. So 
it is what it is. It's uh, migration bass fishing. But want to uh, say hi to everybody in the chat, and we're going to get rolling because this is going to be Coach's show, Coaches and Questions. And uh, so any questions that you have, start loading them up in the chat right now. We've got James Flynn, I Feel Fishy, John Hutchinson, Antonio, good to see you, Bill Decals, uh, who I just mentioned, Brian's Guitars, uh, Peter Niblick, Bill, uh, Angel, Parent Perez, I can't, it's so hard to see. I have to dim my screen so that my glasses don't reflect uh, saltwater chatter in there. So uh, welcome, guys. Um, we're going to go right to the coaches right now. So I'm going to bring them on stream. We'll do a quick introduction. You should know these guys by now. We've got, uh, we've got Pat Ogletree, who's been on, I think, the most for these coaches shows. So welcome back, Pat. Thank you, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing, I'm doing well. I, I love doing these shows and uh, I'm, I'm excited for it. And then we got Matt and the Yak, uh, the recent tournament winner. For those that are unaware, Matt went out and just uh, first place in a Redfish tournament uh, last nice. week, I believe it was. So, uh, welcome. Congrats. Good to see you back. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. This is going to be a fun one. <clears throat> Good one. So let's see. Uh, let me get the first one up here. We're just going to roll right into the questions. You want me to put them up, Rich? Yeah, if you would. Uh, there was one I wanted to bring up first, and I wanted to. Let me just find it here. Just a comment. I just hope there are more fisher women than just me. I just want to make a comment about this. We actually have a lot of women that follow this live stream and podcast. They have since back when it was before Salt Strong. Um, and we actually have a lot of women guests that come on as well. So if you're a woman and you are watching this, you are not alone. Trust me. I, I have met several women out on the water who came up to me and uh, they they mentioned that they listen to the, sh to the podcast when they're driving to the water and they watch the live streams whenever they can. So uh, you are not alone. We have plenty hey, of women. Where's Elle? She's usually in here. Elle, yeah, she might be in here. Uh, she she might be lurking. Uh, what was our guest last week? Uh, Captain Kayla was on. So, yes, you are not alone. So I just wanted to mention that. This is men and women, kids as well. Uh, we have all the ages, uh, both genders covered. So welcome. Good to see you. And Ed, if you want to start with some of the questions, just throw yeah, them up so on the, the screen. The first one I saw that, that came through, uh, I think this would be going for you guys. Um, what rod do you recommend for 33 to 28 inch snook? Uh, anything under 150? Try to pair it up with a Shimano Nasty 5000 and 30 pound Power Pro. Any recommendations? Well, it's going to have to be one of the two guys that fish Florida. I've, as I've mentioned before, and people make fun. Actually, started making fun of me. I've never caught a snook, so I'm not going to comment on this one. Uh, Pat, you want to jump in? Yeah, I was actually literally snook fishing uh, a couple hours ago, but uh, came up empty-handed on the snook. But anyway, uh, and that's in Texas. I'm actually in Texas now, uh, snook fishing. But uh, either way, um, yeah, actually, uh, anything that you're going to do, the rod is really going to be dependent on what you're going to do. Uh, he didn't happen to say if he was live bait or artificial. Uh, so, you know, a, a 28 to 33 inch snook, you know, any of your standard inshore fishing that we have here, the gear that you're using in Florida, which is your medium power, a seven foot uh, to seven and a half foot. If you're fishing open flats, it's going to be perfectly fine. If you're fishing around structure, say you're around some docks or you're around some some mangroves you might want to step up to a medium heavy uh but the honestly the 30 pound is probably overkill unless you're around some really nasty structure i would probably use uh 15 pound and even like a 3000 sized reel uh you know these 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 fish are strong you know these 28 to 30, 33 inch snook are strong uh but you really don't need to get you know into the really big stuff until you're into those 40 to you know mid 40 inch class then you can step into the gear or if you're fishing in passes uh you get passes with current and heavy structure then you'll need to step it up but you know just your standard inshore stuff medium to medium heavy seven to seven and a half foot as far as brand name uh the tfo pro is a great one and one of my favorites right now that i've been using is a cash and element inshore uh american made rod uh, it's about 130 bucks retail uh for the price you can't beat it 
I was thinking about picking that rod up myself, to be honest with you. Yeah, cool. Love that rod. All right. All right. Matt, did you want to comment on that one or are you good? <laughs> no, I'm going to defer to Pat on that one. All My, right. I can count the number of snook I've caught on yeah. two hands. So I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert, but actually uh, species – um, or, you know, excuse me, uh, the, all of that aside, you know, my experience aside, but Pat nailed it. You probably a little over geared there though, truthfully with that, that size reel and that size line, you know, I was going to say you could probably get away with a 3,020 pound line, you know, um, and that's pretty much exactly what Pat said, but you know, your rod's going to be doing most of the work there. To uh, follow that up, he's going to be using live shrimp and ladyfish. No artificials. Okay. Uh, well, then he definitely, um, and if he's using ladyfish, whole ladyfish, he's got a shot at something a little bit bigger than 33 <laughs> inches. I think he named up there at the top. But, um, yeah, you know, just, just to be safe, I mean, with that, you know, you definitely, um, I've seen some some monster snook pulled with ladyfish. So, uh, you you may have the right material there. I'm not sure where he's fishing pets that too. That's something else that's pretty important, you know, depending on where you're fishing, that gear may be exactly what you need, you know, um, but I'm, I'm not sure what type of, if he's on open flats, then, uh, you know, may still be a little bit different. Yeah. I, I'll just say this, not to talk about that specific species or the question, but along the lines that you were going, Matt, I think one thing that that tends to happen is most people over gear um, and we tend to, I guess, as coaches uh, and Ed, you, you tend to do this too. I think we kind of, we go on the low side. So when yeah. we, when we fish for something, we're typically on the lower end and we try to keep it as small as possible. Um, mm -hmm. But with that said, you know, I still have 4,000 size reels that I, well, I did until it sank off the coast uh, when it went over the edge of the kayak. But, uh, you know, I still use those as well. But I think what you'll find out, and, and there was a question in the community, what size reel and what size rod should I have for striped bass? And my answer was, well, just, you know, the 2,500 or 3,000, you're going to be fine. I've, and And as proof of that, I'm pulling a nearly 50 inch fish on that exact setup, you know, 10 pound braid. And as long as you have the right rod, as, as Pat mentioned, he gave a couple of good ones there. Um, you don't have to go up with that higher, that, that more powerful gear, those bigger drag systems on the 5,000 or the 4,000 reels. Now, if you have it, that's fine. Just keep in mind, it may not balance as, as well as one of the lighter reels on some of those rods. So just wanted to make sure that that was mentioned, but I, I'm always the one that says, if you've already got it, fish it, you know, don't get rid of it just because it, it, it's, it's not a 2,500. If somebody says use a 2,500, if it's a 4,000 and you've got it and it's not too heavy for you, fish it, just fish mm -hmm. it until it's dead. And then next time, maybe you go to a 3,000 or the 2,500. Yep. If, and if, that, he is, if he is throwing uh lady fish, just to say with that 5,000 Nasi, He's probably going to want something at least a medium heavy or heavy size. Just mm -hmm. if you are trying to pair a rod to that exact reel, I would definitely look on the heavier end of things, especially if you're throwing live ladyfish. Those are going to be a little bit on the heavy side. So um, definitely want to want to beef up the rod selection if that's the reel you're going to pair it with. Though. Yeah, Sounds and I'm, I'm going to be heading down to Florida the second week of April. So you guys just kind of solidified my new purchases. I got a, um, a tsunami medium. Was it medium heavy? Uh, seven, six, uh, what is it? The nano carbon one. And then I got a 3000, um, eliminator, Daiwa eliminator. So that should be a pretty deadly setup. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, all right. So it looks like Cody, uh, Buchanan, uh, he just moved to Edgewater from Hickory, North Carolina. So I'm assuming Edgewater, Florida. Uh, trying to figure out saltwater. Uh, his boat's not fixed, so he's fishing from the bank. I would love to know how to catch a redfish bank fishing. 
Well, that's actually my home water, so uh, I guess I'll jump in on this one. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the uh, Mosquito Lagoon area, and uh, it, it's it's absolutely possible to catch redfish from the bank there. But uh, it's just like any other thing; you want to make sure and uh, not just pick any place that you can walk up to. But you have to, uh, you know, think about the seasonal trends. You know how it's spring; we got transition periods. These fish are really bait oriented. So if you get to a spot, you want to make sure that you're going to see jumping mullet, that you're going to see, you know, some fingerling mullet in the water where you're at uh you'll need you know a little bit of current but these redfish uh they don't like to fight the current that much they're going to be current adjacent so if you can find a point that's got some current that's sweeping around it on the back side of that point a lot of times that's where you're going to see your fish but you know being land-based you're probably going to be um my, my best recommendation is to get on a map, find a couple of, uh, you know, parks that are in the area uh, that's got some structure nearby and don't spend too much time in one place. If you get to a place and it doesn't look like, you know, you've got the bait there that there's not enough current or, you know, it just doesn't look right, then move to the next one and uh what, what's going to happen is after a while you're going to you're going to eliminate some dead places uh right now in, in edgewater uh if you can get near the uh the new Smyrna causeway uh the north side causeway uh there's some there's some redfish in there there's some bruisers but once you get your boat going that's going to open things up and there's there's a lot of fish in the area you just gotta you gotta get to know it cool uh, let's see what's next. Uh, this one for you, Rich. Uh, what area of the country were we catching those rockfish and or striped bass? Yeah, so we were actually today. Um, well, so when Ed and I went out last week, we were near Ocean City, New Jersey. Um, so we were in the central part of the state. And when we were fishing today, uh, I was up in the Raritan Bay, uh, Raritan River area. So um New Jer Northern New Jersey, New York, basically right on the line there on the New Jersey side. Keep that in mind, people, so you don't get arrested and you don't get huge fines. But um, yeah, so it was right in that area. Right, essentially, it was at the the uh, the Raritan where it came out into the bay. And I will tell you that uh, the bass were stacked, not just right there. They were stacked all the way in the Raritan and all the way in uh, the Raritan Bay, like all the way out through the shipping channel. So there were fish stacked all over the place. They just weren't biting. So uh, for those that want to say it's a spot burn, it's the Raritan Bay. It is always <laughs> on fire with striped bass. It is literally the best place on the East coast of the United States to target striped bass in the spring and the fall. And uh, it, it's no exception right now, although they weren't really chewing today. They were there. And if I could throw out a pro tip for if you plan on fishing the Raritan, uh, New Jersey and New York have a very similar saltwater registry program. Uh, make sure you're registered in both states in case you do cross the line. <clears throat> it's easy uh, to cross the line. It's yes, very it's very, very easy. Um, and also the regs are whichever port you launch your boat from. So if you launch in Jersey, you have to follow the Jersey regs. Yes. However, if you do venture into New York waters, they can stop you while you're in the waters. Mm -hmm. Um, so be really careful with that, especially striped bass. Um, they're all over it and there are, there are fishing game people out there. Uh, I didn't see them today. However, I have, uh, seen the posts. Fishing game came by uh, for people that were uh, night fishing two nights ago. So or was it two nights? Yeah, I think it was two nights ago. The fishing game was making their rounds. So just make sure you're, you're careful. The last thing you want to do is mess with striped bass because that's the one that they're always focused on the most. All right. And it looks like Starcaster put in a more, more so a shout out. Uh, not to sound like an ad, but before I joined the insider community, I was very skeptical. I thought what could... Make a community cost 90 bucks. Boy, was I wrong. So thank you. Yeah. So we should, you know, I'm just going to comment on that. I, I think, and I say this, yes, I'm a coach now, but I was a member for a long time. You know, it's like hair club. I'm not just a member. I'm also a client. I mean, I was a paying <laughs> member for a long time living up in the Northeast, mid Atlantic. And uh, the information that you get out of, out of the community, whether you're in the mid Atlantic or Northeast, uh, you're going to be getting stuff from me all week. If you're down south, you're going to get, you know, Panhandle. You're going to get stuff from Matt. Well, you're going to get stuff from Matt and Pat no matter what, because they, mm -hmm. they do things to cross over. But it is a great value. And uh, 
look, if you're not a member already, you should be because you can always cancel and get your money back. So at least give it a try um, and, and go in and check it out. And you're going to be surprised. You're definitely going to be surprised. The things that uh, that we do on this Ask the Coach is it's not even a drop in the bucket. Um, we have a lot of insiders that watch and they don't ask their questions here. They ask them in the community because they get they get more comprehensive answers. Um, you know, we've talked about a couple of quote unquote spots, but we didn't. We talked about areas. Um, you're actually getting spots inside the community from not only from coaches, but also from other members. And you can always meet up with people and head out on the water with other people that are in the group. It's it's awesome. It is, and well, you also get tackle discounts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would consider that an ad. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, where are we here? Uh, Craig, uh, North Tampa Bay Wade Fisher here, headed out this weekend for vacation. Any tips? Yeah, I'll, I'll grab that one too. Um, not to step on any toes here, but uh, uh, the Tampa Bay area at, down to Sarasota uh, just got hit by a pretty bad cycle of red tide. Uh, so I would try to um, focus my efforts on the area where there wasn't red tide. So once red tide hits an area, the fish, they, they, they move out. So it takes them a while to move back in. Uh, good places to look, it's going to be uh, what they call the upper Tampa Bay or old Tampa Bay, which is further inside. Typically this time of year, I like to move out towards the mouth of the bay, but the mouth of the bay was just, uh, it was riddled with, uh, with uh, red tide. So uh, I would do definitely uh, try to go up into the upper old Tampa Bay uh, area. Uh, Picnic Island and Weedon Island are good places right now because they didn't get hit by red tide and there's plenty of places to get in the water and wade. So check those two out. All right. So I'll, I'll jump in here too. I'm, I'm not familiar with the uh, geography of Tampa Bay very well. So Pat may be able to help with this, but um, my first snook on artificial ever came out of Tampa Bay at Piney Point. Um, I don't know if that's uh, really a part of the area that's being affected right now really bad or not. But if it's not, um, I know that Piney Point is a place that you could go uh, to, to definitely get on a bite. I was out there, um, I think, 40 minutes and caught my first snook um, on, on artificial on our Fred paddle tail. Um, able to walk out there, identified bait and birds, oyster bar, a dock. All the signs were right. I was just uh, had to wait for the fish, you know, and it worked out. So that's a place that uh, you could definitely check out. And if you want to see that full report, it's at saltstrong.com. Awesome. Uh, sorry, guys. I think I have a ballast going bad here. My lights are flickering all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Uh, it's special effects. It's a high yeah. budget production that we have well, here. <laughs> I just I hope I don't trigger anybody's epilepsy or anything. Um, all right. So we have I feel fishy. Like back to the north. Uh, what tides were you fishing today, Rich? Uh, well, that was that was part of it. Uh, when we got there, we took our time getting on the water because it was slack. It was slack low. And uh, we went out. <laughs> we took our time getting on the water and we just sat there and our drift was zero. There was no wind at the time. So we fished basically the incoming. And uh Luckily, we got out of there when the winds kicked up before outgoing started because that would have been a disaster if we had gotten hit with uh, outgoing and that that wind coming in. Uh, so it was it was basically incoming tide that we fished, which, by the way, was not what we wanted to fish. Our entire hope for the day was to just kind of spend a few hours just fishing the whole incoming and pick up a few fish and actually fish the outgoing. That's where we thought we would produce, but the winds kicked up. It got dicey. I, as I mentioned earlier, I thought it was getting a little dangerous. So I got off the water. The group I was with got off and everybody else made a beeline for the launches at that point. So, Gotcha. Uh, let's see. Where did I had one here? It was up a little bit. Uh, Angel. Um, she wanted to know the best saltwater bank beach and pier areas around Tampa. Uh, I think we just kind of touched on it, but maybe a little more and towards like the beach bank stuff. Um, any, any of the, 
uh, beaches that are near passes right now are going to be holding fish. So uh, near uh, John's Pass, near uh, Clearwater Pass, uh, any, any of that area. Uh, the snook are actually uh, moving around the passes right now. So uh, you can catch snook off the beach right now. And, uh, you know, if you're just looking for fun fishing, you know, the ladyfish are always there. The big jacks are moving through. Uh, you can catch redfish there. So my, my suggestion would be, you know, I'm not sure where you're going to be staying at in Tampa, but if you can find, uh, you know, anywhere near a pass, uh, that's where I would go. And uh, incoming tide is usually better. Can I ask a follow-up question on that, Pat? And, mm -hmm. and Matt, you can answer this as well. Why is it that people that fish down in Florida don't like to catch jacks? It's turning around. I think it has to be because it's not good table fare. You know, people don't eat them, yeah. but now they're realizing how fun they are to catch. And it's no different than a tarpon. You know, if it, if a tarpon tasted good, then there wouldn't be any left. You know, right. everybody would eat them all. So that's, you know, we're, we're kind of, I hate to say it in Florida, we can be really snobby because we have so <laughs> many fish that we can catch and, you know, we have fishing year round so we can be selective. Uh, I hate to say that, but yeah, I think that's really the deal is because it doesn't taste good. Okay. I, I was wondering because I've caught jacks and I love the fight. Well, of course, I wasn't going to eat anything down there. I was staying in a hotel, so I was throwing everything back. So maybe that that is part of it. But man, they're they're a ton of fun. I guess it's kind of like catching. I I don't know, Ed. What's what's the fish that we catch that we hate that other people like? We have that. I, we were just talking about it before we started the the live. You know, I mean, Pete. You know, some people hate hate old trash can slam. You know, as long as it ain't a catfish. I like the tug, you know, if it's a blue fish, those things fight good. You know, if it's a lady fish, light tackle. I love put blue on fish. Quite a show for you. You know, if it's a, if it's a Jack, you know, I just caught a Jack. Well, my first fish tournament day was a Jack that was probably, you know, I don't know, 16 inches or so, but I thought I had a monster. You hear me? And <laughs> like, I just knew right when I'm like, Oh, this is the one, but, you know, it was, a, you know, and when I got it in, you know, or once I was fighting it, I knew, I knew it wasn't a redfish, but, um, you know, uh, but when, you know, it was doing the spirals, you know, kind of up under or uh, as it was coming up to me, um, I was just like, man, this, this is like a kingfish, you know, like what it would do pinwheel up under me uh, when it got close to the boat. And then when it got close, I saw that it was a jack and I was like, man, that was a lot of fun, but not what we needed. You got to go. So, yeah. uh, you know, but I mean that did I'm, maybe I'm different, man. Um, you know, maybe uh, I'm just I'm out there for to feel the tug and, and um, you know, have fun. And, uh, you know, whether or not it's going to be good on the table is kind of irrelevant to me, whether or not, you know, it puts up a good fight. I uh, I love catching almost anything. You know, there's there's a comment. Maybe we can get to this question later, but like brown sharks. I love catching sharks, you know at any time and some people just can't stand it when sharks come through and i'm like this is awesome i i absolutely love it i don't know i mean i guess you could compare jacks in florida to um sea robins up here i don't mind catching sea robins you ever get stung by one of them things no it hurts it's like the only fish that hasn't got me yet it's not fun yeah, my hands, that. by the way, are all bloody today just from striper mouths. And I only got three. <laughs> I'm, I'm like a disaster on the water. You got to build them calluses, Rich. Come on. I know. I know. Three. <laughs> only three small ones. Yeah. All right. And then we have uh, James. Uh, hmm. Where's the best places to find fish in the West Choctawatchee Bay? I hope I didn't destroy that. <laughs> Choctahatchee. Oh, that's yeah. close. That's in the Destin area. That's between Panama City uh, and Pensacola. I'm familiar with where it is. And actually, James, I've never fished uh, west Choctahatchee. Um, however, I did just fish east Choctahatchee a month ago for the second stop of the Florida Redfish Series in Panama City, a place I'd never been to before. Um, in Choctahatchee Bay, I just kind of scouted it out for our members a week earlier. And because of that, you know, kind of video I'd made for our members highlighting where I think would be some good spots to fish in that area. 
I was kind of, you know, really desperate for some places to find some good fish. And I figured, hey, why not? Let's go in blind into this spot uh, that I just analyzed for our members. And I went in there and uh, and won um, two separate divisions in the kayak tournament in East Choctahatchee Bay. Now, I was around the ICW and down there by the uh, fingers at the Choctahatchee River, um, but uh, around Point Washington area. But uh, there are some there there's a lot of good fishing in that bay um but i just also did another spot dissection for our members around the jack lake area that shoreline if you're familiar with that shoreline james um that could be a good place to to look for as well that shoreline there around eglin would be um pretty good place to look is is james an insider do you know i don't but okay. if he is and he gets to see these spot dissections, he's getting access to some really good stuff. Yeah, I was gonna say if but the video is also you also have a public version, right? Uh we do have a public version of that report coming soon. Um, but only members get to see the spot dissection right. where we go on the map analysis. Right. Another big perk of being a member right there. Join up. If you're not a member, oh, join up. He is. He is a member. So, so James, real quick, go to the fishing tips section in the community and look for it. I think it's, what's it titled? I fished the, my spot dissection or something like that? Yeah. Uh, going in blind. Yeah. It's a good one. I I I watched it twice. I got, you got two reviews from me. Um, so, James, go in and check that out. Yeah. But that, that should help to translate for the rest of the day as well. All right, Rich, you started this one, so I think you want to touch on it. Uh, Norisa asked, uh, he was, said he would like to uh, try for brown sharks from the beach this summer. Yeah. Uh, what type of setup? Yeah, so, I mean, brown sharks from the beach this summer in the mid-Atlantic, I mean, it's uh, it's like fish in a barrel sometimes. Um, it, it's not uncommon to see them swimming through the waves around all the bathers. So don't fish there. It'll just get the bathers angry and especially their parents on the on the sand. So go a little distance away. The setup that I use is essentially what I use for live lining uh, bunker for striped bass. So I use a, a inline circle hook, nine aught up to 11 aught. And I just take a half of a bluefish. Um, I, I fillet half of it and then cut it in half. So I'm talking, you know, a uh, 14 inch smaller bluefish. And you just put it, you just thread it onto that circle hook, throw it out there with the weight. You don't want it to travel very far. So you want it to hold bottom and just let it sit there. But look, don't just throw it out anywhere. Look for a trough, look for uh, some type of structure off the beach. And you're almost guaranteed to pick up brown sharks especially at night you're you're almost guaranteed that you're going to get brown sharks in the yeah, Atlantic. he just added that he's planning to go at night so yeah that's i mean nighttime is shark time and it's it's just an outstanding way to to go after brown sharks you can get some really nice ones depending on where you are uh new jersey and delaware i can tell you 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 can pull in some really solid brown sharks from the beach and all you have to do is go in the daytime find that trough find a cut or something like you know something where the, the water's running out if you can find a rip cast it off to the side of the rip so you're not directly in that current and just let it sit and that's all you have to do bait it and wait yes all right so i'm, I'm curious to hear your uh, uh pat and matt's uh, thoughts on this stuff. Um, Nick's asking about gulp. <laughs> does the color really matter? Now, this is a bit of an inside joke between Nick and Rich, but I'm I really I'm curious to see. Number one, do you got you guys in the South use gulp? And number two, does the color matter? Um, yeah, we actually use gulp, and you know I I don't treat gulp as a separate category of lure. I treat it. I would fish it exactly the same way I fish all my other soft plastics. Uh, so I have, you know, a certain guideline that I'll use as a starting point, but it doesn't mean I stick with that. So if it's a low light situation or, um, you know, I'm, I'm having overcast, I like sticking with uh, darker colors. If it's clear water with uh, bright skies, I'll do uh, more natural colors. But again, that's a starting point. I will change. Uh, but just because it's gulp doesn't mean, you know, it's, it's you know, going to catch something. You still have to apply some knowledge to that. 
All right. My, my opinion's a little different. So just <laughs> brace yourself. Okay. So, hey, I asked. I'm ready. <laughs> so, yes and no. Okay. No. Gulp, in my opinion, this is just me, personal opinion. For me, gulp color does not matter in most scenarios. But I will use what looks most natural. And for me, in most conditions, that's going to be New Penny. Um, now, I will use New Penny across the board no matter what gulp product I'm using. I will vary that under one circumstance. If I am sight fishing, I will then use a gulp that is, you know, a white or, you know, pearl or something, maybe one with a chartreuse, tail, something that's visible to me at 30 yards out, you know, in two feet of grass and, or excuse me, two feet of water in between a couple of blades of seagrass and hopefully right in front of a redfish's nose, you know, so that is when color matters. Does it matter to the fish? I don't use loud gulp color options. So I can't say whether or not those affect the fish because I don't use them enough um, because I always just try and use what's most natural. But to me, in my mind, when I'm using gulp, it's because of the scent, not because of the color. If I'm trying to dial in on a color profile, gulp is not where I'm trying to do it at. I like that answer. <laughs> it's a very good answer. And I agree. There are times I will say this and, and because I'm the one I actually said, when are you going to admit that color doesn't matter with gulp? Yeah, I, it does sometimes. Um, in all honesty, I, I think it does matter. Sometimes I think colors can matter. I think most of the time the fish doesn't care if it's a salmon red, which is actually orange or a sardine color or a chartreuse. I think Quite often, it is the scent of the gulp. It is like fishing a a bait, a natural bait. So, you know, but again, you know, there are times where they'll only hit bubble gum pink for some odd reason. Um, but th that doesn't happen all that often. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what we got next. Uh, Miguel, uh, he is in Charleston, South Carolina. He's been debating on getting a trolling motor. I can't swallow the price. He's got a 19 foot center console. And is it worth it for fishing? Um, I'll take that one. I wouldn't own a boat without a trolling motor flat out. That would be the first accessory <laughs> I would buy for it. Um, fishing without a trolling motor on a center console boat like that inshore is, you know, it, it's almost like trying to, you know, you know, walk to the mall on one leg and hop the whole way. It's, it's, you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage. Uh, yeah, trolling motor all the way, whatever, whatever the cost. Matt. Matt. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I mean, I'm in a kayak, so I, I'm in a pedal vessel and I'm here to told you if I had a boat, well, I do have a boat here in freshwater, but it, I promise you, it's got a trolling motor too. Um, and I actually um, had the motor on my, my outboard on my bass boat go out and i fix the trolling motor before i fix the outboard because i can still fish with that trolling motor i can't effectively fish with an outboard now granted i'm on a lift and i don't have to you know cross a lake to get to a fishing spot i can use my trolling motor to put out but that's why people put trolling motors on kayaks um, as well, because trolling motors is effective for covering water, but it's effective for covering water at a um, controlled pace. Um, you can definitely control the rate at which you're moving and, and the rate at which you're covering ground. Some are even if as effective as locking you into a GPS position. So um, there, you can go way down the rabbit hole if you want to, you know, I mean, but I, I agree with Pat 100%. Not a single one of my fishing vessels other than a kayak would have uh, would ha would go without a trolling motor for sure. Rich? Yeah, I hear you, Rich. Yeah, well, I, I got a counter opinion. 
um, <laughs> as the old guy. Uh, so I had I had a 19 foot center console uh, skiff, and I never had a trolling motor on it. And yes, it predated when they were actually so, quote unquote affordable, like they are now, where you can actually get some that that work well, are reliable, and everything. I caught a lot of fish on that boat. A lot of fish. I mean, permanently stained decks on that boat because caught a lot of fish. So I would say if you can't swallow the price, don't. Um, you can get away with it. And you and, and I'm going to add this second part on. You will be a better fisherman when you can swallow the price. And you should eventually try to swallow that price because it is a game changer. As as Pat mentioned, it totally changes the entire game on you. So it's almost like if you can't take the price right now, if you're uncomfortable with it, then don't get it. Learn to fish it without it. You're going to be bumping that outboard constantly. Um, you may even be anchoring and, and getting a heck of a workout if you're in a strong current trying to get that anchor back. But uh, I would eventually try to get one. But um, it, it's definitely, uh, you know, if you can fish without it and catch fish, you're just going to be 10 times better when you actually have that that trolling motor on there. And I'll leave it at that. So I'll jump in on this one too, because I actually am on both sides of this coin. So my primary is a kayak, so I can control my drift, speed, angle, uh, you know, everything pretty much like having a trolling motor. I also have a 19 foot boat without a trolling motor. And that's typically where we take, when we take the whole family out. So it's, it's definitely tougher to be in the boat and, like Rich said, you're bumping it in and out of gear, trying to keep it, you know, control your drift speed, stuff like that. Um, so if you can swing getting a trolling motor, definitely do it. We don't have one right now, and I'm trying to work on my dad to <laughs> to, to get there. Um, currently, the boat has a 90 horse Yamaha two stroke. It's getting a little tired, so I think we need to repower first and then go for the trolling motor. But, you know. If you can do it, it's it's definitely a game changer. And I've I've fished on boats that have them and don't have them, and they're the the proof is in the is is in the results. They definitely will help you produce more. Uh, let's see, Brian S. Um, he is up in the Manatee River, far enough uh, that the water is brackish. Do you have any preference in colors uh, for brackish water? You want to take that, Matt? I think we're going to say the same thing, but yeah, go go ahead. I, I, I can tell we are. Go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, brackish is uh, it, it really it's more about the color of the water and, and not necessarily the salinity level. If you're talking about brackish, uh, I'm assuming you're talking tannic water, and I absolutely love the Fred, uh, the which is a pink color for whatever reason. It just produces well in that tannic color. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Rich, your video, I, you, you had to switch to the Fred to get on. Uh, to get on some fish on that one day. There's just yeah. something about it. But uh, I, you know, in other than that pink color, that Fred color, it seems to be a toss up between a lighter and a darker, but it, it almost always seems to be that pink color. But again, with anything, when it comes to colors, there's a starting point. If it's not producing, then you need to change up. Yeah. I, I personally start with a, again, it doesn't matter brackish, where I'm fishing brackish, it is tannic. I mean, it's like a tea color. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's almost no visibility. I actually start with a gold digger and then go to the Fred second. And then I move over to the lighter shades. I've had a lot of success so far this season doing that. And the Alabama leprechaun or the gold digger uh, are what I start with. And then regardless of which one I start with, my second one is always the Fred. I, I consider the gold digger and Alabama leprechaun one try. I'll use one of them and then I'll go to the Fred and then I'll switch over to the, a slam shady or a pearl or even a gold, just something that's a little bit lighter, maybe some more flash. Um, yeah. So he's saying it's tea colored water. So water. right. Exactly what Pat said, the Fred, the Fred mm -hmm. should work. And yeah, I have a video that proves it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Watch out. Watch a bunch of my reports. You'll see the Fred's the one. That's the one you want. You're probably fishing water that's similar to the color that mine gets or a lot of the area that I fish anyway. It's It's got a lot of freshwater um, dump off into where I fish. So 
uh, you're probably, I mean, I'd say Fred is a, is a great spot to start. And then from there, um, you know, try out the gold digger or the Alabama leprechaun. Those are uh, definitely my other go-tos um, in other situations when the water or fish um, act a little bit different. Those are the next two I go to, but in that color water, I always primarily start with the Fred. All right. Uh, we skipped over Tim. So he, you know, gently reminded me that I forgot him. <laughs> Good job. Tim. Uh, <laughs> when do you think the bite will start in Panacea Shell Point area? It is non-existent this past weekend and he <laughs> wants to catch some fish. I'm going to take this one too, if you guys don't mind. Go sure, um, why not? <laughs> so, Tim, I don't know if you're a member or not, my man, but those are the waters I fish more than anything else. Um, I'm in uh, Panacea uh, regularly putting up reports for our insider members, and I can tell you that the bite is on fire in Panacea right now. Um, and I got pictures to prove it uh, and reports to prove it as well. Um, I can tell you, I went out with a couple insider members just the other day. I caught eight redfish on one point. I anchored down and sat there for 20 minutes and caught eight redfish. That's after this was the second school of redfish I'd identified. Okay. Um, first one I caught three out of. So I can tell you with complete certainty they're there, but your timing uh, for the area you may have been in may have not just been right. Um, also, I'm not really sure what you were throwing. Um, I know that those fish around that area do get pretty finicky. And I know that those fish often will move on that flat. Like in Panacea, they'll sometimes be right up on the shoreline around the grass line. And then if it's gotten hot for a couple of days, they'll push off and they'll go a little bit further off of that flat. Um, okay. I see. Yeah. I see you are a member, Tim. All right, Tim, we'll make sure I'll uh, send me a message in the community and I'll forward my most recent report to you from Panacea. And you can see exactly where I was exactly what I used to catch them. And you'll see exactly how we got it done, my man. But, um, I promise you they're there often the bite can be tied specific. They do like, um, you know, that, uh, that high water level, if you're going to be fishing that grass line, um, as soon as the water allows they get right on that grass line so push in if you can uh with what vessel you're in um i don't know uh, what you're in but if you if you can get in there shallow that's where they're at i promise especially around those little creek mouse and those little feeder mouse i promise they're they're there just um you know you may have to uh work those grass lines and those shorelines a little bit slower first thing in the morning start with uh top water moonwalker's great it's always a great search bait to find where those fish are at. If you're not getting anything there, go subsurface. Mulligan is crushing it right now for me. Fred color. Fred color. Pay attention to what I told the last guy, Tim. Use that Fred color. It's uh, it's it's going to be a game changer for you if you haven't already. Well, there, we, there we go. Cool. Uh, all right. So we got another one from Gavin. Uh, he's curious uh, to... If the guys at Salt Strong could ever test the effectiveness of Doctor of the saltwater slam scent against Doctor Juice original shrimp, and if you have or have not already, no, I, I not that I know of. I've never I've never used it. I went uh, to be honest with you. I was a big Procure fan before I went to the Doctor Juice, and those are the two things that uh, that I've compared uh, one over the other. Uh, the all I know is the the Doctor Juice slam scent. Uh, it works great, so I haven't. I haven't really varied from that. Yeah, I I haven't actually used the original shrimp scent. I like Pat, big Procure uh, mm -hmm. guy, and I still use Procure, Procure yeah. but I, I use Dr. Juice more now. Um, look, they both work, and they both work really well. Um, and uh, I, I, I think, though, and Pat, maybe you know this. Isn't there a difference in the the type of scent, oil versus water base between the saltwater slam and the shrimp scent? 
Um, I, I think the compounding is different. They have more, you know, enzymes in the, in the other, I don't know the scientific, uh, you know, makeup of it or anything, but supposedly the formula that we have that's in the inshore slam is different than the others. They're supposed to be, you know, more stuff in it, for longer. lack of better terms. Oh, it definitely lasts longer without yeah. a doubt. So I got, I got a story with that. Um, and this is actually what sold me on it being a uh, what it seemed like a runny type of liquid. You know, I was always a Procure fan. I had the gel on it. I thought it lasted longer. Well, I been using the Dr. Juice for a little while. And, you know, I, I wasn't really sold on it because of the fact that I thought it wore off quicker. Well, I washed my hands about three or four times when I got off the boat and uh, my dog came up and started smelling my hands after I washed them three or four times, it lasts that long. So, uh, yeah, I've been a believer in that ever since. And I got some on my leg and he was sniffing my leg right where that Dr. Juice was. So I'm like, my okay, hand still smells from today. My yeah, hand still oh, smells. And I've been off the water since like noon <laughs> and the, I've showered yeah, the, and everything. Why are you smelling your hand? <laughs> yeah. It's the Dr. Juice. And actually I have a spot <laughs> on the side of my kayak where I it's right in the handle. I actually stick the little bottle in the handle. So it's always right mm -hmm. next to me. And that's where I pour it over. So it's a little on the outside. It is, mm -hmm. I cannot get it off of there. So it's totally, everything just kind of like the water just runs right off of that section. And just so you know, I clean my kayak in a car wash. So I'm using <laughs> pressure washers yeah. and brushes on it. And the doctor juice is still there. <laughs> it's still in that spot. So be careful when you're handling it. It, it will, it will get on things and it will, it'll stay. Yeah. That's, that's actually whatever I tell people when they ask, well, how long does that stuff last? And I said, well, just put it on your kayak. Yeah. You find out yourself. Just, just put it, just put it on something and then try and get it off. Yeah. It lasts. Yeah. It, I, and I can smell it on my hand right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going back and I'm screen grabbing that. <laughs> no. Oh yeah, it's on. <laughs> All right, I got one from Tad. This is a good one. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on the use and effectiveness of power poles? I'll go first. Nope, I have no idea about them. <laughs> Matt, I was just on. I was just on a boat today and you was using them. Uh, that would be the number two accessory that I would put on a boat, but after a trolling motor, it's, uh, it, but again, you know what, you know, now that I'm thinking about this, it depends on your style of fishing. So my style of fishing, uh, it's absolutely, uh, an awesome tool, but you know, deep to me is three feet shallow is about eight inches. I know you guys, I think shallow is what about 10 feet, you know, so it, it really depends on, on your style of fishing. But for me, uh, definitely, uh, I would definitely have to have them, uh, anything. If you're fishing in water, say eight feet or less, it's a, it's, it's awesome. Matt, you, you have one on your kayak. So once, and I know Tad has kayak, um, mm -hmm. once you talk about that. Yeah. Uh, so I just got one not too long ago. And if, uh, I don't know, uh, if y'all aren't aware, we're not sponsored or, um, you know, affiliated with any of these companies, but, um, I just got one and I kind of put it off for a while because I'm going to be honest, even for a micro power pole for a kayak, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good investment. I mean, they're it's like four or 500 not, bucks, aren't they? Say what now? They're like four or 500 bucks, aren't they? Uh, the system's like 600. Then if you do a battery uh, or the battery pack, that's another hundred and some change. The poles, another, you know, I mean, it just adds up, you know, it's an I mean, investment um, then. so yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're almost a grand in no time, you know? Um, so it can be this for a micro for like my kayak or a solo skiff or a small vessel, you know? So yeah, it's, it's a pretty big investment. Um, but I'll say this, the tournament I just won, I would not have won it without it because of 20 mile an hour plus winds sustained. We were getting beat up. Um, it was raining on us. It was just miserable conditions. And the plan I had was to move from spot to spot that I'd marked and planned out. But with 25 mile an hour winds blowing, I couldn't hold any spot without a solid anchoring system. Now, could I have used a stakeout pole? Yes, I did for a year and a half. And there's nothing wrong with that. But 
I also, with a stakeout pole, every time I want to move, have to manually pick it up, stow it on my kayak, then move where I want to. And if I you know, want to stop again, I got to put it back in. Now, one of the cool things about a power pole is often when I'm looking for fish, they're grouped together, right? So when I'm looking for these fish and I hook up with one, maybe I'm scouting or something. I don't want that one fish to drag me into where the rest of them are. I don't have two hands to stop, deploy my power or my anchor pin and then fight this fish. But what I can do is reach down on my lanyard, tap that button two times, drop that anchor behind me the whole time I've been fighting this fish. So now I've controlled my boat and I can still control the fish and not blow out the spot that I may potentially want to dial in a bit further. You know what I mean? So they are, are they effective? Absolutely. Do they have their place? 100%. Is it a big investment? Definitely. It's, it's definitely something you got away though. I mean, uh, for me, now that I have one, every kayak from this point forward will have one because I now know what I'd been missing out on for so long that I just used, you know, a, a, an anchor pin that I had to manually deploy, uh, you know, and for tournament fishing, it's definitely effective. You know, you know what they say, power pulls down, trophies up, man. Yeah. It, it I say for Tad, it, it depends on what depth you're going to be fishing. What's your max depth on that micro? Uh, so mine is an eight foot pole and I'm, um, I'm staking out and, you know, six, six and some change. Yeah. Okay. So limited. So Tad fishes, New Jersey, also a, a recovering bass tournament guy. So, <laughs> so yeah, you say you, you may have just sold one there, Matt, when you said that you won the tournament because of it. <laughs> well, and, and also too, I don't know if you know, Rich, but our big waters are designed for them things. Yes. It's not, the the hole in the back by the rudder for that for that pin to drop and it has the deck just for the power pole mm -hmm. yeah so it it is definitely designed for that um uh, tad honestly i know you you might actually want one <laughs> now now let me ask you this uh matt you had 25 mile an hour winds did you encounter any of the issues that these guys on boats have that only have one power pole so that was you actually, um, you know, perfect segue into that, Rich. Uh, you you mentioned depth. That's yeah. super important. I didn't know the depth in which he's fishing. Again, like Pat said, deep water to me is six feet. So if I'm, you know, fishing in six feet of water, you know, I'm that that power pole's not doing me much good anyway. Um, you know, uh, but um, definitely with those 25 mile an hour winds, I would pinwheel, yeah. you know, on that axis, wherever that, um, you know, wherever that power pole was down, I was going whatever direction the wind was blowing, I was getting blown around. So, um, you know, and now they do have systems where you can mount two dual power poles to the back of your kayak, you know, and, um, you know, again, one power pole, big investment Two double the investment. So uh, right. maybe take twice the amount of time to think about that one. <laughs> yeah. D deep water here is 35 feet. Would you say at 20 to 35? I would say closer to 40 to 50. I mean, on oh, the backwaters. Yeah. So, certain yeah, spot, there's some left. holes back there. Yeah. Um, all right. So James Flynn, imagine the smell <laughs> of your truck. I don't, <laughs> I don't terrible. want to, but I have an idea. Actually, it doesn't smell bad. It's it's <laughs> not today. All right. I think we have time for maybe one more. We're coming right up on nine o'clock here. Um, let's give Angel another shout out here. Uh, she's asking, what is the best bait and or lure for sheep's head? Uh, she's been trying with shrimp, but the small fish are just stealing her stuff. Can I go? Rich? Yeah, go ahead, mm -hmm. Rich. All right. So the best bait actually did a video on the three best baits it's on salt strong. It's, I think it's just three best baits for sheep's head. And, uh, I I'm going to say a fiddler crab, uh, a sand flea, and then shrimp. The problem with shrimp is that everything eats shrimp. Um, shrimp might even eat shrimp for all I know, because they're so, they're just such victims of the sea. Everybody wants to eat them. 
Um, but I would go with the crab first. And I use, actually, I use Ed's jigs when I fish for sheep's head. Uh, they're called jawbreakers or shepherd jigs. Um, and they're shameless uh, plug. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I, I mean, we all share what we use, right? So, um, Pat probably doesn't use yours. Um, so he'll, I'm sure he'll mention what he uses, but I, I like to use the jigs. I don't use, I don't use hooks. I don't use the regular traditional sheep's head rigs. Um, I just like the control that you have over a jig uh, a light one, so a half an ounce or less is typically what I'm using. And I'm and I'm kind of if you look at Ed's jigs, you'll see that the style hook is just beautiful for it. So that that's what I would say. I agree. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Pat. Um, you know, she she said here uh, a lure, the best lure. So we talked about shrimp. The shrimp's great. Problem with sheep said is they're notorious bait stealers. So you really gotta, uh, you really have to be paying attention to what you're doing. Typically, uh, if you're vertical dropping, what you want to do is just raise your rod tip up slowly. And if you feel any resistance, that's the fish you need to set the hook. Uh, but as far as lures, um, there's these little lures that are made by Chase Bait that are called crusty crabs. They're about an inch and a half, maybe two two inches across, uh, and they're pre-rigged. They got a hook right in them. Uh, those look super realistic and they are effective on sheep's head. I would just douse them with some sort of scent and uh, you could do the same thing with a vertical jigging or uh, around bridge pylons or anything like that. They're effective, but it's called a crusty crab. I actually picked up a couple of those. I want to give them a try this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I Once used it. them last year. They're, they're good. You just have to be careful of the current because there's like almost mm -hmm. no weight on those. Yeah. Um, so it depends on where you're fishing for them. You know, in the Northeast and Mid Atlantic, it's it's a lot of it is bridges, which mm -hmm. has just current just flying through there, even at slack tide. So you have to make sure that you get into an eddy when you use those. But yeah, they're they're nice. Those crusty crabs are nice. I, I have a I think a half a dozen of them sitting in the box right now. I have some ideas to mod them too. Matt, are you uh, are you targeting sheep's head with a with a lure? No, uh, I'm I'm not. I actually went on a trip to the Jacksonville Jetties and um, caught sheep's head with with live fiddlers. Um, but I will say, if you're trying to, um, to, well, two things. Number one, if you're using those crusty crab lures, a great way to use those is in tandem with the live bait. So if you're already dropping something down that they're actively going in and grabbing really quick you can sneak in one of those artificials that'll you know cause them to you know catch a hook a little bit easier um and another thing is you know rod selection is super important when targeting sheep's head again i don't know like you know what where you are what type of fishing you're doing or how deep or if you have a lot of current but sheep's head because they have a really quick and soft bite sometimes if with a heavier rod for me at least when i was fishing the jetties i'm beefed up with a medium heavy rod because i'm at the jetties but you know these uh sheep's head were stealing my fiddlers and i couldn't even feel the bite because i was have i was using too heavy of a rod so when you target sheep's head make sure um you know you're using something that may not be uh too heavy for you to be able to feel those those small bites when you're getting them that's a good point. I, I, I love that tip. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, we're at about 9.05. Do you guys want to do a couple more? Do you want to wrap it up? Uh, no, I wanna... Actually, go, go ahead, ahead, Brad. Sorry. Uh, I was going to say uh, Cody Jackson. I want to go ahead and uh, hit his question up real quick. Um, Let me bring his up. Yeah. Uh, as someone who's only fished Florida flats, what are some good ways to locate solid spots? In an environment like I'm assuming Louisiana that has a lot of the same type of structure, uh, what are some things to look for? Um, Cody, actually, to be honest with you, I just did a spot dissection with you in mind. Uh, if you want to send me a DM uh, in the Insider Club, I'll send you the link to it. But if you want to go look for it, uh, it was last week's spot dissection for Louisiana. Uh, but yeah, I knew you were going to go over to uh, De La Crew and uh, take a look at those redfish over there. So I, I uh, broke down the spot for you. Uh, but if you can't find it, send me a DM. I'll send you the link. Pat cool. always crushing those spot dissections, man. I love doing them. 
<laughs> I, I, I love I, I love the feedback when we get to like revisit them a week after we made them and we get to see the comments from somebody who's local to there and tell you, you know, just some confirmation on what you find or somebody's gone there after it came out and come back yeah. to say, hey, when exactly where you went and you were right, they were there. It's it's because of the trends, man, the trends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. These spot dissections really help me. You know, a lot of people, they try to figure, you know, they ask me, you know, it's like, how can you bounce from place to place to place and be able to find fish? So one thing, you know, in case, you know, somebody's watching that doesn't know, I actually live in an RV full time. I travel the country and I never fish the same place twice. And I'm always able to find fish. But one of the reasons why is because, you know, I don't just show up to a place blind. I've been doing a spot dissection on it for probably a month out and really studying the area. And if you put that knowledge, you know, in with the trends you could typically find fish when are you coming up north pat i'm trying i will to be in maryland i'll be in maryland in july isn't that cute he Little, that's north no that's not north yeah hey, come up well, like okay. two more hours come up come up two more hours <laughs> actually I think, I think maryland i think is still considered the south it is yeah. yes yeah, you're yeah. below the mason dixon line yeah yeah but, you know, you can come to the extreme southern part of New Jersey and still be below the Mason-Dixon line. Hmm. So you can come up and see Ed. I think the very tip of Cape May County, technically, if you take that dotted line and throw it across, it's it's on, it's on the southern part. Whatever hmm. I need to say, Pat, to get you coming up a little bit further <laughs> north, I'm going to say it. Okay. We'll see what we can do. Yeah. <clears throat> so I uh, my comment before... Pat talked was we should get to uh, Cody's question before we go. So, well, that's what I was. I, I thought it was a good one. I'm like, do we want to push it or not? <laughs> yeah, no, we started a couple minutes late, so I think we're good. Uh, with that said, I think we're going to need to wrap it up now, guys. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. Next week, we have the illustrious Nick Konashevsky coming on. So he's going to be on Monday night at eight o'clock live. So if you've never met Nick, you'll have fun asking him questions. He is a very engaging guy. Um, he, I mean, if you've never met him at a show, a fishing show, you're missing out. He is a very entertaining guy, loves to talk fishing, and uh, it's going to be a good conversation. So he, he's going to be here Monday night. Uh, for all of you that are insiders, thanks for, for tuning in. For all of you that aren't, what are you waiting for? Get in there, get signed up, and we'll see you in the community. You'll get to see spot dissections. We actually should do a live spot dissection sometime just so people can see what we're talking about. Um, I used to do that way back in the day on my own channel. Um, it wasn't the same exact format of what Salt Strong does. It was kind of like the, the cheap version of it, but... Um, I think it'd be a little more polished now. Yeah, yeah. We'll let Pat do it. Matt and I will just sit and critique. <laughs> <laughs> no, pressure's on. Yeah, great. Pat's yeah. the goat. I'm telling you, y'all think it's a joke. Pat's the spot dissection goat. I watch Pat spot, like, spot dissection. I'm talking over my, I'm fumbling over myself. I'm getting so excited. I get excited about Pat's spot dissections because he thinks in a different way than I do. So it's, and, and even Rich, you know, like I watch all the other coaches videos when I get a chance to man, because we all have a different way of approaching things. So, you know, even collectively, even as a coach, man, just like you said, Rich, you were a member. Well, so were me and Pat for a right. long time before. I mean, right. Hey man, we hair club for men, you know what I mean? We're here, <laughs> we're clients too, you know, but uh, yeah, you know, it does work, you know? So, I think it's, um, you know, the, the spot dissections and being able to watch each other co or all the other coaches, we're learning from each other constantly, you know, so even being able to watch one of Pat's on the water reports or spot dissections, I get to see the adjustments that go through Pat's head. So I can tuck those away for when I'm in a situation, I'm like, man, I don't even know what to do right here. But Pat had this video that said, He's been in a situation like this and this worked for him. Yeah. You know, it's those, it's those little adjustments like that, that make all the difference, man. And, and for me as a tournament angler, being able to learn from, from the other guys, you know, the other coaches next to me, that's just um, really a great opportunity because I got some of the best in the business right next to me. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Agreed. Before we go, I'm going to sneak one more in because I think this is a quick oh. and easy uh randy uh if we go camping for two days are you able to keep breadfish on the drive home i'm gonna say yes as long as it's cleaned and gutted and on ice i don't see a problem 
that was my exact response. As long as you gut it, dress it, and it's on ice, it's fine. It's fine. It'll be fine. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't keep fish. I don't eat fish. I don't know. Good. <laughs> I used to work at a seafood market. You're fine, my man. As yeah. long as that fish is gutted, you are yeah. good. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We're going to cut it here next week. Nick Konoshevsky is going to be on. So until then, get out there, get on the water, and get some tight